picks up, what it does is it picks up one mill at a time, picks up the droplets, they start out packed, and then it streams them past the detector. This is what's happening here. Single file, and the detector then scans them on two channels, FAM and VIC, for fluorescence. Here it kind of looks like they're going back, which is kind of, which is a consequence of the frame rate and the fact that they're all, all the droplets are exactly the same, so they, um, they look like they're going back, which is kind of cool. Um, and again, and now, <laughs> and then there's, we provide software for actually reading the, the droplets, the positives and the negatives. And here, the graph here shows droplets through time, the first through droplet one through droplet 20,000. And for every droplet, we plot the fluorescence of the droplet on the y-axis. The negative droplets have low fluorescence, just a little bit from the um, unquenched probes, or poorly quenched probes. And uh, these droplets are the ones that have amplification in them, so meaning the PCR reaction actually happened and there was a target in there. And, uh, and you can count up those points. We provide the software, as I mentioned, that allows you to visualize what's going on to arrange your plate and allows you to visualize the acquisition of the data as it's happening in real time. You can zoom in and see more clearly what's going on. There are two channels, the VIG channel and the FAM channel. On the both, both channels, you can see the positives and the negatives. Um, this, these plots here represent the histograms of the fluorescence. They're, they're a direct function of what's going on here. So you have a whole bunch of positives right here and there they end up making this histogram over here and a whole bunch of negatives over here and they end up fitting into this histogram over here. So the number of, you can draw a threshold between the positives and the negatives and you have, uh, generally speaking, uh, for decent assays you have really, really wide latitude where you would draw this threshold. All you need to do is be able to tell the positives from the negatives. And as you can see, it's quite easy. Uh, this is what's happening in the FAM channel. This is what's happening on the VIC channel. So you can duplex your sample this way. And you can also plot FAMs versus VIC. And this is an example of a plot I personally love because this is 20,000 points plotted from a single experiment on FAM and VIC. These are the points that have FAM and VIC. These are the droplets that have FAM and VIC in them. These are the ones that have FAM only, these are the ones that have VIC only, and these are the ones that have neither of the fluorescence. So you can count very precisely for each of your droplets which of the target that droplet has. Finally, just to sum up a little bit, touched on all these points um, already, but the droplets, their per reaction will make 20,000 droplets, which, because the droplets are each one nan nan nanoliter, ends up adding up to 20 microliters total reaction volume. The droplet reader throughput, which is, uh, which is probably the limiting factor here, is 48 wells an hour. So you can, in a few hours, you can do a 96 well plate worth. And we do two color detection, FAM and VIC. Now, the next I would like to show you examples of the data that comes off the instrument. And I'll start with some, of, uh, some results from our internal testing. Basically, once we got the instruments, just running them through a few tests to show some reproducibility and how well they work across a range of concentrations um, to, to qualify the performance of the instrument. And then I'll go, go, to, go into more specifics about a couple of stories about specific applications, uh, which should be pretty exciting. I think they have a lot of exciting potential. Also, note that these data actually came off our initial runs of the experiment, uh, of the instrument. So these are good data, but they're not good because we cherry-picked the best experiments, they're good because the instrument fundamentally works. So this is, uh, this is the example of what I, was, um, um, what I was mentioning before about testing the instrument. So once we got, uh, this is an example of three different units that we have in-house, and we run a titration curve of um, Staphorius um, at different levels, uh, at different concentrations, right? So you start out at uh, roughly 200,000 copies per reaction, 20 microliter reaction, roughly 10 copies per droplet, and going down tenfold each time. And as you can see, there is really good linearity across the entire range. And one thing to keep in mind also, the dilutions, right, when people make the dilutions, they're really hard to make them exact. It's one of those things that people don't generally end up measuring very well because there's no, there's no other instrument that can really measure the error, the variation, and how people make when people make the pipetting errors and make their dilutions, but here we actually end up seeing that variation quite well. So it's, it's hard to put some of the error bars on this because there's more variance in how pe when people dilute um, compared to the measurement. Now, 
here's an example of the plot of what happens when you pretty much saturate your droplets. Here's one, I don't know if you guys can see this, there's a, there's a little triangle that connects the plot to the, uh, to the titration point. And uh, here we have, um, let's see, roughly it was a 20,000 uh, positives. So a whole bunch of positives and a whole bunch, 20,000 targets, a whole bunch of positives and a whole bunch of negatives. Um, fewer positives, fewer positives still, very few. This is roughly 15 positives that come up. So this, is, this means, I don't know if you guys can see this, but 15 points up here above in fluorescence is 15 molecules that we detected in this 20 microliter volume. So this just shows you side by side the, the bottom three dilutions that we did. 15, then 10 times as many molecules here, and then 10 times as many molecules there still. And uh, as I mentioned, you can transfer, transform this history, uh, the, the fluorescence plot into a histogram. And um, these are the histograms on the bottom. I uh, hope some people can see that in the back. But basically, you have a whole bunch of uh, negatives up here, and then you have a whole bunch of positives, and then you can draw a line to set the threshold between the positives and the negative to determine how many positives you have and how many negatives you have. And this is the same graph, just in a log scale, because sometimes you have very few positives and you still want to be able to see them, and so log works better in that case. Next story that I would like to talk about is uh, rare event detection. And this specific, specifically, I'll talk about uh, this gene called EGFR. In particular, I'll focus on detecting EGFR L, something called EGFR L858R mutation in the presence of high wild type background. Now, EGFR mutants, um, I don't know, some of you may know this, are found in some non small cell lung ca cancers. And uh, they're important because carriers of the mutation, this is an activating mutation. Respond, respond to TKI class of drugs. And um, in general, there are a few reasons why you might want to be able to detect, would be interesting to detect this mutation in the presence of high wild type background. One is that oftentimes you'd want to be able to detect these mutants in plasma because many patients uh, have inoperable tumors so you can't actually get the tumor issue out. And so you would have to rely on some other method of uh, obtaining the information about the tumor. So if you're looking in plasma and there is some, some of the DNA that gets shed from the tumor, uh, you might be able to pick up this mutation. But of course, there's lots of other wild type DNA that's floating there. So whatever mutant you would hope to find would be present in the context of uh, a large amount of homologous sequence that only differs from your target by one base. Also, Sequencing experiments, when they've sequenced solid tumors, have suggested there's actually quite a large variability for any given mutation, what fraction of the tumor it's actually present in. Some cells will have the mutation, some will not. The significance of this is still unclear. You know, it's not clear whether if you have a partially, uh, partially mutated tumor, is it going to respond to TKIs? Is it going to respond slightly worse? Is it not going to respond at all? So this is this probably should be an area of additional research, but there has not been a tool to find these mutations in a homologous background well up until this point. And also mutation testing of this kind can be used to monitor drug response. So you give a person, you know, let's say they have, uh, they have cancer, you give, them, um, you give them the drug, and you expect uh, the cancer to shrink, and you expect the, um, the, 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 the concentration of this mutation to go down, but uh, you need a way of measuring. And now you, we're back to this problem where you're trying to measure in plasma, you're trying to detect fairly small changes in the concentration in the presence of uh, similar sequence. And it's something that's difficult to do. And here's a demonstration of how it is difficult to do. Uh, specifically, we did this experiment where we did the spike in series of, um, of a mutant in the presence of uh, wild type background. We took a cell line that carried this mutation. And we, we made a mixture where the mutation was present 10%, 1%, 0.1%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.
So real time essentially fails once you start going below 1% of your mutant within the presence of homologous background. You just can't detect that molecule, that, uh, that smaller fraction of the difference in there. Now, how can digital PCR help? Well, so the idea is that um, if you start with your sample, now let's say for, for, for the sake of this example, there are 40,000 wild top molecules in your sample. This is the bulk reaction that real time would be working on, right? And you have 40 mutant molecules in there. So that means that your target is present in your reaction at about 0.1% frequency relative to wild type. So real time essentially probably doesn't have much of a chance of ever finding that. But now once you partition this sample into 20,000 droplets, you're gonna get roughly 20,000 droplets without the mutant, right? And those are going to have on average about two, uh, two copies of your wild type background. But you also have 40 droplets with a mutant, right? Because there are 40 mutant molecules in there. And those, those droplets with a mutant will have one molecule, one mutant molecule, and again, on average, two wild type molecules. And now if you do a PC, the PCR reaction within this droplet, your target has a much better chance of amplifying because it's present at 33% relative to the background and not 0.01%. You're partitioning away the background and then the droplets that actually have your target end up standing out that much better because they're not competing with this whole ocean worth of um, wild type sequence. So how does this actually work in practice? So here's the, an example of a DDPCR run using 1%, 1 spike in dilution. We're doing um, our mutant on the FAM channel right here and uh, the wild type on the VIG channel down here. So in the same graph, in the same one set of experiments, you're counting both the number of molecules of the wild type background that's in your sample and the number of molecules of your target of the mutant in the sample. And this guy comes out, if you actually look at the number of positive, the number of negatives, the number of positives, there's about 40,000 targets in there. So roughly two copies of the, sorry, two copies of the wild type sequence per droplet in your sample. When you do the same estimation on your, um, on your FAM channel, which is, uh, um, which uh, picks up the concentration of the mutant, you end up estimating that there's roughly 400 copies of the mutant in the mixture. So uh, roughly 1%. Now, if you go down further, this starts getting hard to see, but you'd have to trust me on this. Um, you still have two copies per droplet of your wild type in this particular mixture, but now you have 10 times fewer copies of your target, um, roughly an order of 40, if you count up the dots that are above this line, uh, above the negatives. So we go down to 0.1% quite readily, 0.05%. Again, the same number of uh, positive, the same number of background molecules in there, 40,000, but this time we have 20, I think it's a, well, it's not exactly 20, but it's about 20 molecules up above this threshold that we end up getting, which corresponds to 0.05% um, relative, uh, relative presence of the mutant, which means 0.01 copies per droplet is what we're detecting. And we can go down even further. And in this case, again, the same number of wild type molecules, 40,000, but in this background of 40,000 wild type molecules, we're able to detect six copies of the mutant. And again, it's a, it's a sequence that's one base different from your wild type that we're detecting here. So we've pushed this down to 0.01%, six copies. This is a summary of these results that I've just gone through. Um, basically, dilution series, the concentration, of the mutant, the concentration of the wild type, and then the estimated uh, mutant fraction. And this, I think actually this is averaged across three wells. So for each one of these experiments, we ran three wells, so 60,000 droplets worth, and did the estimate from that. 